So obviously I don't have to take the SAT anymore, but if I were to take the SAT again, I would definitely want to know these five questions. Mainly because these questions show up on the SAT almost all the time. And two, these questions are very simple to solve as long as you know what you're doing. And three, these are solved the exact same way. So essentially, these are going to be your SAT score boosters on your next SAT. So let's find out what they are and get a higher score on your next exam. So the very first question looks something like this. And by the way, guys, every single question we're going to go over in this video is going to be linked down below. There's going to be a PDF sheet where you can download and print out and try them out with me because that's how you get better at SAT. You don't get better at tennis by watching other people play. You get better by playing them yourself. So let's play some tennis. So number one. The question says, which the following is equivalent to the expression shown above right here. So it looks like we're given a bunch of radicals and we have to combine them and turn them into fractional exponents. So how are we going to convert radicals into fractional exponents? So that's the main concept that the question is testing you on. And it's actually pretty simple. So for example, let's say we have cube root of five. How can we convert this into fractional exponents? Well, what happens is it's going to be whatever is on the inside goes out by itself and we're gonna have a fraction on the top. And whatever the number is on the outside, that goes towards the bottom, and the number on the inside, because it's five to the first power, the number on the inside is gonna to go to the top. And that's how you convert radicals into fractions. So we're gonna do the same thing with fourth root of 25. So what's on the outside goes at the bottom of the fraction, and what's on the inside goes on the top of the fraction. And you see how every single answer choice has five as the base of the exponent. We got five here, but we have 25 over here. So we're gonna to need to convert 25 into a five somehow. How are we gonna do that? Well, we know that 25 is essentially the same thing as five to the second power. So whether it is 25 to the one fourth or five to the second to the one fourth, it's gonna be the same thing because 25 and five square are essentially the same thing, right? So the second skill you need here is going to be exponent on exponent. How are we going to simplify that, right? So the key here is whenever you have exponent on another exponent, what you're going to do is you're going to multiply the exponents together. That's the second concept you need for this question. So two times one fourth, two times one fourth, what's that going to be? That's just going to be one half, right? So it's going to be five to the one half. Okay. So we have five as our basis for both of the numbers. So let's combine them. So if we go back to the original question, it was this times this. So it's going to be this times that. So five to the one third times five to the one half. Now, how can we combine this into just a single number, right? Because that's what the final answer choices look like. Well, the thing is, whenever you have exponents and they share the same base, base is the number that the exponent is applied to, right? They both share five as the base. And whenever you have the same base and you're multiplying, then you add the exponents together. Okay. One more time, same base multiply, you add the exponents together. So this can be simplified into five to the one third plus one over two. We're going to combine the fractions by matching the denominators or the bottom numbers. So it's going to be two over six plus three over six, which is going to be five over six, right? So we're going to get final answer as five to the five over six, which means our answer is going to be choice B. So does that make sense? This would show up as like a difficulty four question on the SAT, mainly because it's requiring multiple concepts about exponents. And if you're kind of shaky on your exponent skills, check out the link in the pinned comment to get a quick refresher on what you need to know about exponents. Let's move on to the next question. Number two or number 13, the question says, we're given this expression right here and it's asking which the following is equivalent to the expression shown above. So what you need to recognize here is that when you look at the answer choices, you can get a lot of information from the answer choices. We see that every single one of these answer choices have this fraction at the end. And what do we know? We see that they all share the same denominator as the original expression, which is a common structure used in polynomial long division. You guys remember polynomial long division where you do this x cubed plus 2x minus 7 divided by x plus 2. That's polynomial long division. And typically, these things represent what? These are the remainders. So that's how you can recognize these questions. And when it comes to these, there are two ways to go about them. First one is just a good old polynomial long division. Do your math, get to your answer, and pick the answer choice. A second, more efficient way to solve these types of questions, especially if you know that all the answer choices have what? They have different remainders. 
we have positive 19, negative 19, positive 21, negative 18. That means we don't even need to know these things. As long as we know exactly what the remainder, <laughs> as long as we know exactly what the remainder is, then we can quickly identify the correct equation without doing all that. But you might ask, John, the only way to get the remainder is by doing this and then getting to the end and find out what your remainder is. Well, the thing is, there's this thing called remainder, remainder theorem. A remainder theorem is going to be essentially a shortcut to find the remainder quickly. So what I mean by that is you can simply use what's known as the remainder theorem to find what the remainder is very quickly. And how remainder theorem works is first, you have to set the bottom equal to zero. X plus two is equal to zero and find out the value of X that makes the bottom equal to zero. Once you have found that value, you plug it into the top equation. So we're going to do minus two to the third power plus two times minus two minus seven. That's going to be negative eight minus four minus seven. That's going to be negative 19. And that is going to be our remainder. So how it works is if you find a value that makes the bottom equal to zero and plug it in to the top equation, the result is going to be your remainder. So the key takeaway from these types of questions is one, whenever you see this structure, it's referring to polynomial long division. And more importantly, if all the answer choices have different remainders, then you know that you can use the remainder theorem to quickly find out what the remainder is and find out your answer. So again, if you want to get a quick refresher on what you need to know about polynomial long division and remainder theorem, go to the link in the pinned comment for a quick refresher. Now let's go to the next type of question. So this is the third type of question you should know for the SAT. And it looks something like this. We're going to give, we're going to give, we're going to be given two equations and the question is going to be asking how many solutions does the systems of equations have? The important thing is that whenever you're given multiple equations, right? Whenever you're given multiple graphs or multiple equations, solutions are referring to the number points of intersections. And in this case, we're given what we're given a parabola because it's to the second power. We're given a parabola and a line because it's to the first power over here. So essentially, we're given a parabola and a line and we have to find number of intersections. And we ask ourselves, how can we find out the number of intersections between a line and a parabola? You use what's known as discriminant. But there's this thing called discriminant and its sole purpose is to tell you the number of intersections between a line and a parabola, just like we have over here. So first, you have to combine the two equations together. So you see how they are both set equal to y? We're going to combine them by setting them equal to each other. 2x squared minus 3x plus 7 is equal to minus 2x plus 1. We're going to move everything to the one side. 2x squared minus x plus 6 is equal to 0. And now we're going to use what's known as discriminant. And discriminant can be found by using a formula. d is equal to b squared minus 4ac. That's the formula to find out the discriminant. So if we plug it in, we're going to get discriminant is equal to b squared minus 4ac. And what's our b value? b value is the number in front of the x. So it's going to be minus 1 squared minus 4. A, a value is number in front of x squared, 2. And c is going to be just number right there. And if we combine the numbers together, we're going to get 1 minus 4, 8. We're going to get 48, which means our discriminant is going to be equal to negative 47. And does that mean there are negative 47 intersections? No. When your discriminant is negative, that means there's going to be zero solutions or zero intersections. If it's positive, we have two intersections. But if it's equal to zero, we have one intersection. That is the relationship, and that's what you need to know about discriminants. So coming back to this question, for these two lines and parabolas, we know that discriminant is equal to what? It's equal to negative 47. And when, if it's, when the discriminant is negative, we have zero solutions or zero intersections. So our answer is going to be choice A. So the main takeaway from this question is line parabola, and you're looking for number of intersections, you have to use what's known as discriminant. That's the sole purpose of discriminant, and it can be found using this formula. And here's how you can interpret the result. If you want to refresh on this topic, then comment down below. Let's go to the next question. So this is a pretty popular type and the question is going to say something like, what's the Y coordinate of the intersection between these two equations or these two lines over here? Why are they lines? How do we know it's a line? Well, X to the first power, X to the first power. When the highest exponent is one, that's how we know these are two lines. 
If the question is asking you to find out the point of the intersection, you have to just set the equations equal to each other. Now, there are two different types of intersection questions you're going to see on the SAT. One of them is going to be finding the number of intersections like we did over here. Okay? You'll either be asked to find out the number of intersection or the exact point of the intersection. And because we're looking for the Y coordinate of the intersection, we're looking for the exact point or the exact coordinate of the intersection. And how can we find it? All you have to do is just set the equations equal to each other. Why? More on that in a second, but let's solve it out first. 2 over 3x plus 21 is equal to 5 over 3x plus 9. So now that we have found out the x value, we just need to plug it into the, either of these equations to find out what the y value is. So let's just pick this one. So we're going to get y is equal to 2 over 3, 12 plus 21. That's going to be 4, 8 plus 21 is going to be 29. Our y value at the intersection is going to be 20. So the exact coordinate of the intersection is going to be 12 comma 29, but the Y coordinate is going to be 29. Does that make sense? Now let's go back to the part about setting the equations equal to each other. Why do we have to set the equations equal to each other? And if you're thinking, ah, I don't need to know it, I'll just memorize it. Trust me, if you wanna hit a high score on the math section, it's all about understanding why things will work a certain way. So here's a five second summary. We have two lines, right? We have, we have two lines and just roughly, roughly sketch it out is, I don't know, it might look something like this, completely random. But point being, when the points are intersecting, at the intersecting point, what's gonna happen is that there's going to be a X value and Y value. And whether it be this line or this line, at this point right here, at the point of intersection, they're gonna share the exact same X value and the same Y value. And because we're looking for the point of intersection, that means at that point, their Y values are going to be the same. At the intersection point, their Y values are going to be the same. And for example, let's say your Y is equal to three, right? And Y is equal to three. If this is equal to three, and if that is equal to three, then they're essentially the same thing, right? That's what allows you to set these equations equal to each other whenever you're finding intersections. So long story short, at the intersection point, they share the same X and the Y value. So they share the same Y value you can set these two things equal to each other. So that's what you need to know for this question. And if you need a refresher, check out the link in the pinned comment. And let's go to the last question. So the question is asking, it's giving us two lines right here. How do we know it's a line? Line and a line, right? And it says, in the system of equations above, if the system has no solutions, what's the value of J, right? So from the previous question, we know that when you're working with two equations or two graphs, solution is referring to what? Intersection, very good. So going back to the question, it tells us that these two equations have what? They have no solution or no intersection. They just never touch each other. And how could we possibly find the value of J that would make it so that these two lines will never touch each other? Well, one of them is for you to convert them into two line equations and find out what the matching slope is, but that takes forever. Here's a faster way. Whenever you're working with lines and you're looking for number of solutions or number of intersections, you're gonna use what's known as the matching rule. And how matching rule works is, first, you're gonna line up the x's, y's, and the numbers. Here's what I mean. We have y minus jx equal to seven, right? So we have three y, we're gonna bring x to the other side and move number to the other side. That way, our y's, x, and the numbers are all lined up. And from here, we are going to create a fraction based on the numbers attached in front of the y's, x's, and the numbers, okay? Here's what I mean. What's in front of y? There's a one. So it's gonna be one over three for y. And what about our x value? It's going to be negative j, negative j over one. And for our number, it's going to be seven over negative 28, right? And now, according to the matching rule, when there is no intersection or no solution between two lines, that suggests that the fraction of y is equal to the fraction of x, which means one third is equal to negative j over one. And now looking at this, how can we find out what j is? Just cross multiply. Negative three j is equal to one, j is equal to negative one third. Our answer is going to be choice C, simple as that. And again, you don't want to get confused between the number of solution question versus the exact location of the solution question. This one was testing you on the number of solution, whereas the one above was testing you on the exact point 
of the solution. And the main takeaway from this question is knowing that when you're working with two lines and you have to find number of solutions, you just simply need to use the matching rule. And you definitely want to know what the matching rule is. And if you don't, check out the video in the pinned comment for a full guide. If you guys found this video helpful, give the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if there's additional topics you want me to cover next, comment down below and I'll see you guys on the next video.